it is Mike Levin on Saturday, June 18th, about 1.40 a.m. I don't know if I'm going to be uh, posting this video or just uh, using it for a little bit of self-therapy, one way or the other. It'll go up on YouTube, either as private or as public. I certainly am not going to premiere it. Right? I'm dropping my kid off. Who has rejected me this weekend? I love them unconditionally. And this is something that's probably going to be looked back upon in a very different light than, than it all went down tonight. And it went down. <laughs> they were not thrilled about being picked up. For the reasons, you know, I would love to go into, but it's probably in taste, but my stories are mine, so I think if I have the police called on me, I, I deserve to share with my, with my audience that I have had to answer to the police tonight, who have, after hearing my story and my child's story, sympathized with me, think that that kid should be in public school. First time the thought had occurred to me. Oh, oversharing? Nah, I'll try and keep it there, you know? If, if I wasn't shooting this video, I would be listening to the latest book installment of Expeditionary Force. Skippy the AI, Skippy the Elder AI, Trust the Awesome. Uh, and Joe Bishop, it's a buddy series. And it's getting really good. I'm up to one called Match Game. It's the 14th and uh, most recent book. I think there's only going to be 15 or 16 in the series, so it's close to the end. Kind of like a big showdown. And I'm really looking forward to it. I'm feeling the pull of that even as I, uh, as I shoot this video. But... You know what? <clears throat> I woke up at like 3.30 this morning. 3.30. Because I had that Christmas Eve feeling. I had that feeling you get when you really want to open your gifts. And um, well, I'm Jewish, so it's more like Hanukkah feeling. But you know what I'm talking about. You got stuff waiting for you and you just can't wait to get to it. So I had a project like that. And, you know, I try and wrap up as much of it as I can uh, early before the work day. Get some streaming in maybe on the project. <clears throat> and I had a few fun and interesting ones leading up to this. I'm on the verge of something I'm very... So it's, it's thing upon thing upon thing that I'm excited about. So my mind is in a very good place there. And uh, maybe it's stuff like that that sort of offsets the uh, more difficult, <laughs> more tumultuous, more growing experience stuff one goes through. You never get done growing. You never get done growing. These Are these my stories or are they my kids' stories? I guess I, I really got to be careful. But, you know, I'm like, you know, I... I said, I said to them once, you know, on these weekends where that seemed to be treated like very discretionary, very like could be used punitive again, punitively against me. I'm like, you know, that's not really right. When you have joint custody, that's that's like a legally binding thing. And you know, when when you're pulled out of a weekend, I could call the police. They'd be on my side on it. Now, I wouldn't do that, but, you know, I made the mistake of letting them know that that could happen, so I'm getting beat up. Oh, call the police, call the police, call the police, and it's latched on, so there's so much anger there. <clears throat> and it's not anger over some recent, you know, I guess, stress of the move. There's a move coming up, right? So I'm not going to be in this place. I'm in this lovely little mountain cottage place. I gotta, I gotta move a little closer to the kid. For these very reasons, you know, I don't like what 
what's happening. And I feel, I know, <laughs> it's been proven to me that I have to be closer. So I'm gonna be closer. And when these other tangentially related topics come up, like weekends being taken away from me punitively, and I say, you can't really do that. That's not, you know, uh, the way it works. And the way it works is I am beaten up with all the time. That's not the way it works. It's boom, 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 boom. And then I say a few times, that's not the way it works. And I am like the criminal bad guy, like a super villain out of the comic books, blamed for every woe under the sun. And <laughs> when the police arrived, I was like, okay, great, you know, look, you, I don't like to do this, but here is the custody agreement, okay, just get that done with. And then the next thing is, you just talk to the kid, you know. Uh, I was hoping that they'd come around, you know. Uh, a few weekends in a row have been canceled on me by their choice or otherwise, but you know, I've got my feelings about it. An 11 year old child who expresses their thoughts with these so particular legalese terms, I don't think so. I think someone has, has been coached a little bit, and that's just my feeling, and I'm free to say that. These are my stories, these are my feelings. And after, after the police arrive and I, I talk to them, I say, look, this is the situation, you know, and they're like, well, I have to talk to the kid. I'm like, well, of course, and you know what? I'm not even gonna loom over. I'll walk over, I'll go find something else to do to talk to the kid. And then they, they call me back out. One goes to talk to them. The other stays to talk to me. It's like, I feel you, man. And, you know, we go into the situation in a little more depth, and I explain to him what I'm trying to do. And he's like, you're doing the right thing. You're doing the right thing. So when everybody repeats the same thing going, look, it's very clear, and you're right. Then at some point you got to trust your instincts and say you're right. My problem is I don't have a backbone. I'm I'm a confrontation adverse, right? Like I'm an SEO, I'm a search engine optimizer, so I'm like Mr. Invisible Hand. You, know? you don't need to know I'm there, and I know I got that way because because <clears throat> of the way I was raised, right? I got a background in this. My my mother had their issues. <laughs> ended up, now whatever it was growing up, who knows, but it ended up being schizophrenia, right? She went nuts and disappeared multiple times. Like went nuts, had this like wanderlust thing and disappeared for years at a time. And then I would get these mystery phone calls in the middle of the night. Mom, is that you? After a year or two? And it's like we thought, I, I thought she was dead. Like relatives of mine, my cousin, said, oh, no, I, uh, they didn't want to ever tell me, but they thought my mom would be gone. So she's living as a homeless person in Mexico, right? That's what it is. The first time I go out to rescue her, I rent a nice white, whatever, uh, Ford Taurus type thing. So it's like a mistake. In, I don't mean to do this at all. This is not my intent. But I end up like driving in into the streets of Mexico like some Ringo in a white knight horse thing. And I find her and I, you know, coerce and cajole her into the car. I get her back into the States. Uh, the <clears throat> I find out where she is because the police in Mexico call me and go, you know, your mother is out here and we're gonna have to put her in jail. We can't have a homeless person on the street here. And she's not gonna do very well in jail here in Mexico. She's not gonna survive it, is basically what they told me. So I was coerced by the Mexican police to, to come get her. And I probably would have anyway, but because of them I knew exactly where to go, what streets to drive up and down looking for her. 
So I finally find her, right? Get her in the car. <laughs> the, um, yeah, usually it's immigrations, right? So Mexico's immigrations, Mexico's immigrations comes with me as far as they can because my mother is some sort of like jumping out of the car risk. Clearly she doesn't want to go back to the States with me. And I'm like, who am I? I was like 18 years old. I don't know, maybe 20 years old at the time, a few years out of college. My dad recently died. My dad kicked it when I was, oh yeah, so 21, I graduated college at 21. My dad died. I took over his check, check cashing store for about a year. And during that year, I was attacked. I was attacked by a robber. I was running a check cashing store. My dad did not use an armored car, so neither did I, which meant I made the occasional run to the bank. I made the occasional run to the bank. And during one of these runs, a guy comes up behind me with a hammer, tries to hit me on the back of the head with a hammer. Luckily, I'm carrying and I hear him running. So when you're carrying money from a bank and you hear someone running up behind you, by the time he was on top of me and the hammer was coming down on me, I was turning and pulling out the gun and plug, 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 plug. Four times into him, fifth one goes through someone's window. But I save myself, I save myself. And uh, the person stops, it takes all four shots to make him stop, like, like, quarterback, like football quarterbacker size. So he drops to his knees, he puts his hand up and goes, no. And you know, I'm bleeding from the head. Blood is gushing down from my head from like somewhat of a hammer strike, you know, it kind of raised against me when I caught it. And so, but it, you know, it's your scalp. So a lot of blood's coming out. And, uh, I level the gun at his head, and I've been taught there's only one reason to shoot a gun. It's to kill a person, right? You don't shoot a gun to stop a person. It doesn't save your life. They might be carrying a gun. You don't know. So here I am. It's the fourth shot, and he just barely falls down to, like, his knees, but enough where he's, like, saying no. Gun leveled straight at him, and I'm like, okay. So I dropped the gun in my pocket. So this is just like within a year of coming out of college. This isn't even my mom yet in her disappearance. I'm sub-reference. Stop me before I sub-reference again. So the, the police come and uh, they talk to me. So another lady in the parking lot pulls her gun out, says, I have him covered. And so I go back into the bank and I put the money back in through the teller window. And this is what makes them hit a button, okay? Not until this did they know anything was going on. So they hit the we're being robbed button. I walk back out of the bank and the cops are coming up. And you know, clearly I'm a victim of something. So the cops come up to me and they start talking to me. And um, I am explaining what happened. And I'm like, how long do you think before I pass out from blood loss? And so, then the cops spring into action, they call the ambulance, I get in the ambulance, they, they rush me to a hospital, and the same cop I was talking to in the parking lot of the bank uh, goes with me there, and I tell him the whole story. And when I get up to the part where I say I slip the gun back in my pocket, he's like, do you have it on at you now? I'm like, yeah. He's like, where is it? I'm like, well, it's still in my pocket. He's like, uh, can I have it? I, I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna be reaching a gun for a gun in my pocket. Is that okay? And he's like, yeah. So I take it and I give it to him. And he says, you know, the force needs more people like you. And I just touched me. I never forgot that. And uh, so they stitch me up, give me a few stitches. And uh, a few months later, because they have to, because of consistency, the DA decides to bring me up on charges, carrying without a license, and firing a gun within city limits. So, on the arraignment day, where they decide whether it's going to be a case or not, so it's not really a case, it just goes in front of the judge. So, on my arraignment day, I bring in an army of witnesses going, 
extenuating circumstances in life. He had to take over the business. Um, my dad's lawyer friend, Jerry Shane, came. He says, yeah, my dad's business was a cash poor business, meaning if there was gonna be any inheritance, someone had to keep the, the business running and there wasn't enough money to hire a manager. And if I screwed it up, I screw up the inheritance and I have a legal obligation to my sister. So I have to be here doing this. And they're like, well, did you apply for a license? And I'm like, yeah. They're like, did you get the license? I'm like, yeah. And they're like, do you have the license? I'm like, yeah. And they're like, do you have it on you? I'm like, yeah. And they're like, can we see it? So I like, I pull out the gun license to carry. And the judge is like, so you did everything you were supposed to. You're in a situation you didn't want to be in. And when something went wrong, you defended yourself. Is that what I'm here to, is that, am I correct in all that? And I'm like, yeah, that's pretty much it. The judge is like, he's thrown out. So about two years later, after I start going to work, after I went to work for this multimedia company, this is before the, uh, the web. It's not before the internet, because I'm on the internet by this time, mind you. I'm on the internet through the CBM Vax. If you've watched any of my previous videos, you've heard me talk about the uh, Digital Equipment Corporation, DEC, uh, Vaxes, which is uh, something else entirely. It's a clustering microcomputer that, you know, can run in redundancy. So if you have two Vaxes, they're running all the same system software and one or the other can go completely down. It's like a RAID array, but a RAID array of mini computers. So they're really cool stuff. And Commodore had one of them, CBM Vax, and that's how we all got in, on, onto the internet in those days. We dialed up through modems, old fashioned modems, usually 9600 baud by that time. And we connected to the internet and we got onto the Usenets and the uh, IRCs and uh, all the other wonderful stuff, Gopher, all the other wonderful stuff of the internet before the web, before the web. So I graduated college in 92, right? All that stuff really went down in 92, same year my dad died. He was 62 in 92 and uh, didn't make it to, uh, I guess he died in, when he was 63 years old, really. But he, he made it one year shy of retirement. He was about to collect on Social Security. He was 64 years old in those days. So one year shy of, di of, uh, of collecting on Social Security, he was running this check cashing business and died of heart failure. One morning. That's, when I, that's when I took this thing over. So I ran it only for about a year before I got the heck out of there. And um, I went to work for one of the very companies that I told my dad I would have had, a, uh, that I had a job offer coming from, and I did. It was one of the Commodore spin-off companies called Scala, Scala Multimedia, later Scala Digital Signage. They're still around today. They got bought up by a, a bigger signage company. But they made the software that turned flat panel TVs into digital signs. Before that, they made kind of like multimedia software for uh, for PCs, for um, Pentium era uh, multimedia. They had some fancy names, but it's just when the sound blaster cards were hitting. And uh, I guess Maybe AMDs and Radeons, no, Radeons and NVIDIA. NVIDIA and Radeons, I guess, were the things at that time. And it was the Dune, the Dooms, Dooms from, Doom from ID. And uh, soon after that, Quake, which worked over lands, there were land parties. There were a lot of land parties in Scala. I made the decision to stay away from first person shooter games. Oh, yeah, my shooting days were over. So about two years into working for this company, 92, 93, 94, I don't know, uh, it might have been 90, she disappeared a couple of times, but she, uh, my mom disappears, and then about two years after that, I guess around 96, I get the mystery phone calls. I figure out where 
where she is. I, I rescue her. I'm a white knight. White knight. And it, I guess the experience fills her head so full of glory that after, after I get her back and help the system nurse her back to health, not easy to do. Someone who doesn't want help is not easy to get help. One person cannot, especially a family member, can't check someone in. It's, those days are over. Someone has to want help to get help if they have enough faculties about themselves to work the system, which schizophrenics and stuff, they do. They're smart. At least my mom was. So, my mom rebases herself back in Philadelphia. Philadelphia. And so, I'm in Virginia at this time. I actually went to work in uh, Herndon, Virginia for a few years to work for Scala. That's where their headquarters were. But as it turned out, we had an office back in Philadelphia. So when my mom came back to Philadelphia, again, at great personal expense and uprooting, I uprooted my life. I came back to Philadelphia and went to work for Scala in their local office, Exton, Pennsylvania. And here, after having dealt with my dad, the, the, the martyr, you know, uh, who left me the check cashing place and the shooting incident and my mom going crazy and disappearing and bringing her back and helping her nurse back to health. I go to work for this place in, uh, you know, the burbs of Philadelphia. It's not even Philly I'm working in. It's out the 202 corridor. There's some high tech stuff, but for, for people unfamiliar, you might have heard of Valley Forge, Valley Forge. George Washington camped out with his troops during the uh, Revolutionary War, not far from where Washington crossed the Delaware. A lot of those battles happened around that area. So I was working for a small technology company with a lot of Commodore people. So like the way this uh, sysadmin who worked there the rats jumping off of the ship. That's the way he put it. It was also the password. He called, he made everyone type rat's nest for passwords. So this was, I, I go right from all that stuff now to the sysadmin from hell. I'm starting to get my legs under me. I'm starting to understand a little bit about technology. My beloved Commodore Amiga, I've talked to you about the Amiga computer before, the Amiga computer is going obsolete. 91, 92, 93, 94, 95, the 96, forget it. 97, by the time I was going back and repositioning myself in Philadelphia, it was uh, dead. It's dead, Jim. He is dead. There's nothing you can do for him. So I repositioned myself in Safe Harbor. The safest harbor you can imagine. What is Safe Harbor in tech? Microsoft. I took up Active Server Page technology. Active Server Page, SQL Server, Active Data Object. I got really good at it. My text editor was Edit Plus. Edit Plus. It was not Notepad++. Plus Plus. But it was along those lines. I actually started out on one called PFE, Programmer's File Editor, which was probably the best of the bunch of them, especially with its macro playback uh, ability. It was really good, but it didn't have color coding syntax. So I wanted macros and color coding syntax. So in text editor land, everyone on the Amiga was on this thing called Cygnus Ed, C-E-D. Best name in the world, Cygnus Ed, same Cygnus as from, uh, I guess, Terminator. And uh, we called it C-E-D. Some of us even bought it. So I went from C-E-D on the Amiga, which was awesome, to PFE on the PC, to Edit Plus. With Edit Plus, I was using all the Microsoft competitors to the LAMP platform. You've heard me talk about Linux was an enabling technology. 
on the internet, Linux, Apache, MySQL, and alternatively PHP, Perl, or Python, right? Those are the three big, like Python way back in the early days, oh yeah, Python was there. It was there for systems called Clone and Soap, precursors to Django. So you think Django goes back pretty far, there was Clone and Soap before it, so Python right there with the rise of the web. Yeah, Python was one of the early languages. It's not a latecomer to the game. It's not being jury-rigged for the web in later days like some people might cast it. It was there from the very beginning. So, instead of being on the LAMP platform, because it was all very scary stuff, I actually had a copy of Mandrake Linux. I believe it was the Red Hat lineage. It was one of the lineages. Uh, they had shrink-wrapped in the stores. You could just buy Linux off the, sh off the shelf and install it on your 386, 486 computers, what have you. And I did, I did. I did multi-boot. I could switch between the Windows. It might have been Windows 95 in those days. Just barely. Windows 95 and Mandrake Linux I could switch between. So I was pretty proud of myself, but I could not see myself truly embracing it. So instead of doing the LAMP platform and switching Scala's public servers and all their different systems over to LAMP, I stayed on Microsoft. I was on Active Data Object, Active Server Page, IIS. That was their web server. That was like their Apache or Nginx of the day. It was called IIS. It probably still is for all I know. And MySQL, or not MySQL, it's SQL Server. So they got the best generic name, SQL Server. And when you couldn't get access to SQL Server, you could do most of the same things with Microsoft Access. And in later years, SQL Server Lite. So you could always get something as your database. And I learned how to do all that. And then Java came onto the scene and Microsoft got Java Envy. And Microsoft's Java Envy made them change everything over to this thing called .NET. .NET was Microsoft's version of Java. The whole runtime engine, if Java had the JRE, Microsoft had the CRL or CLR. I always got confused, but the common language runtime, common language runtime, right? So they, they had to just change the wording and the acronyms a little bit, but you knew they were competing with Java. Now the worst part of this was they changed all their web technologies over to .NET to something called ASP.NET. So they tried to make you think it was still the same old active server page you knew and loved. <clears throat> but it was not. It was not. It was completely different. You were almost forced to use VisualStudio.NET. Now this is not the VS Code of today which is relatively lightweight in comparison. VSCode.net was this heavyweight hog that forced you to do all these things Microsoft's way. And what's worse, when you used it for web development, everything was IE6 incompatible JavaScript that where all these things that would normally be web links were these JavaScript postbacks. And everything that you would normally use some sort of session server or carry it on the URL or one of the other ways of cookies maybe. ASP.NET used these giant objects in JavaScript they called view states. And view states only preserved if you use these JavaScript links which were postbacks. And it was this whole spider web of IE6 incompatible with everything else, bloated, mess that you had to use Microsoft's tools to make work. It was horrible. And I never made the transition and I felt very betrayed. I felt very betrayed. So, you know, <laughs> after my dad dies and I gotta shoot that guy and my mom goes crazy and I bring her back and I have to move and I managed to stay working for Scala and the Amiga goes under and the Microsoft technology I base myself on goes away, gets depreciated, sunset such as it were. 
I start to learn my lessons. My lessons, my lessons. I haven't fully learned my lessons because these are when I was like 28. You know, I was getting to be 28 by the time all this played out, right? So I used the best years of my life cleaning up after my dad, cleaning up after my mom, trying to make it at Scala, trying to reposition myself on Microsoft technology. Slap, 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 slap. All right. Maybe she's just not into you. <laughs> Maybe I'm barking up the wrong tree. Maybe far away. Maybe real close by. So anyway, I start to get a fool me once, I won't get fooled again mentality. So I, for the most part, get out of tech. I move to New York City. I take the first really interesting opportunity that comes my way. So there was this student intern I hired at Scala. He lived for, with me for a while. I let him move into my uh, condo where my dad died and I had extra room, which I subsequently abandoned. I abandoned like a $100,000 condo in Philadelphia. I don't even know what happened to it today. It's very cathartic and therapeutic talking about this, but I, I earned big bucks. I abandoned it because I went to New York to become a vice president for the public relations company that launched Amazon.com. So I worked for the person who worked with Jeff Bezos to get their company off the ground. My head's full of stars. And I use my leftover active server page, Kung Fu, to launch this thing called Hittail. Hittail is a keyword suggestion tool that looks at the traffic of a site and figures out the best keywords to that you should optimize for, that you should specifically target, because it's based off of a really easy trick. If something is on page two of search, without you deliberately targeting it, if you deliberately target it, you can easily bring it to page one. It's called striking distance. It's a striking distance report. And back before the days of HTTPS, you know how everything has gone to secure HTTPS? Back when everything was HTTP, anything that came to you as a result of a Google web search also told you what keyword brought the person to your site. Since the move to HTTPS, it's been called not provide, not provided keyword not provided. So whereas you used to see a keyword and now started saying not provided, not provided. So Hittail broke. And Hittail was sold by this time from the place I created it for which went under. The public relations firm that launched Amazon happened to be a boutique public relations firm. Meaning small company served a small number of clients and did not grow with the clients that grew. So they always had a hustle to get the new small client. They went under, but Hittail did not. And I actually, there's sub stories here. I These were in the days of um, co-location. You, you brought your own servers. It was before the cloud, ladies and gentlemen. So I actually installed the hardware of Hittail. I installed the servers. I installed a database server, and I installed a web server. I also did the router, so there were three pieces of equipment on a rack. The internet drop came into the router. I set up a LAN on the router, and it basically did it itself. It gave you a little automatically configured LAN local area network. On that LAN, I connected the internet server and the database server and essentially connected them to each other via the LAN. And that's what ran Hittail. When Hittail was sold, that's what was sold. Along with all the code and everything. But they ended up rewriting it and porting it to the cloud. It was done on Ruby in its first rendition. And then it was sold again from them 
who is a micropreneur, micropreneur, not an entrepreneur, but you know, small companies he would buy and make them profitable and sell them. So Hittail was the first company that this person bought. And he's got more stories, I'll tell you, taking over my code from the active server pages, okay? He hired a Ruby on Rails person, which is what you did in those days. So Hittail got re-implemented as a Ruby on Rails. After that, it got re-implemented again on .NET. As you might have noticed, Hittail was not difficult to re-implement. It was probably on C Sharp, would be my guess. C Sharp was the preferred language under .NET for a long time, probably still is. But Hittail remained viable, remained uh, a running Web 2.0 era app for 15 years, 15 years, from like, 2006, 16, 17, 2021, around 2020, 2021, yeah, it's like somewhere between 2020 and 2021, it, it got shut down, it got turned off. But until that time, I was comped my free uh, Hittail account, and I kept track of my sites in there, and it was fascinating. For the longest time, there was this black river of keywords. And you could actually sit there on an active site and watch your search hits scroll by. It's not that way at all today, because, you know, Google spoon feeds you this data back through the Google Search Console, right? You have to come to them. Please, Mr. and Mrs. Google, may I have some more? And they'll spoon you your search data. But back in those days, you could just sit and watch your keyword data roll in. And if you had an active site with, you know, few hundred hits an hour, you could just watch that river move in front of you and get insights just by, because I would highlight the keywords in the full URL. You would see the referring URL. If it, was a, if it was a Google URL it came from, that line was the Google URL, including the embedded keyword of the search, which was highlighted in black. So when you stacked these up and animated them as they scrolled, which I was one of the first to do those types of things on the internet on the web, it looked like a black river of keywords running past you. I still have some animations of it on my early YouTube videos. If you go back way to the beginning, you can see some of it. So, I seem to be kind of a one-hit pony, one-hit wonder, a one-trick pony, a one-hit wonder. And then I milk these things for as long as they last, and then I don't get the financial reward from them, I just get sort of the glow of association, reputation. Huh. So I get fed up with agency work in New York City, because, you know, that, that um, boutique public relations agency got me to New York. I'm now resettled in New York. I get married. Have a well, kid best thing I ever did. That's what opened, you know, this video up. The kid is getting to those ages where things are going on in their minds and stuff. And I gotta help them. I gotta, I gotta help them. Oh my God, I gotta help them. I become vilified. <laughs> but I, I'm there for you, kid. 100%. Uncompromising. No conditions. Unconditional love. I just have a limits to my actual abilities as a Everyone does. We're all deeply flawed here on this material world. On this earth we find ourselves. We are all bubbles. We are anti-bubbles that splashed up out of the ocean. And you should Google anti-bubbles or actually do some anti-bubble experiments. Put some soap on some water and splash some stuff in and watch bubbles of water pop up and skit on the surface. Anti-bubbles are when the liquid comes up into the gas and the liquid is contained in a bubble, oftentimes skidding over the surface tension of what it bubbled up out of, usually contained within the same soapy whatever that creates a surface tension, and they last there for a little while and then they suddenly blip and get reabsorbed in. So look at anti-bubbles. We are all anti-bubbles that splashed up out of the ocean. Not much more, a little bit more. Replication, DNA replication, anti-bubbles that make more anti-bubbles. 
so that the frothy, foamy, bubbling up process has bubbles looking a little bit like the bubbles that came before. Very brief uh, chemical reactions that play out. 80 to 100 years if you're lucky. Don't take yourself too seriously. 80 to 100 years is not a lot of time. And yet we could be eternal. <laughs> there are multiverse theories. Multiverse theories. <laughs> you should listen to Max Tegmark's Mathematical Universe. Max Tegmark, or Max Shapiro, if you will. But he goes by Tegmark mostly, because it works better in Google. Max Tegmark is an SEO. I'll use my mom's maiden name because there's no tag marks in Google, but there's tons of Shapiro's. Well done. Well done. So he'll tell you about suicide machines. I shouldn't even use the word here. It's terrible connotations, but he explains how to rig up something where, based on quantum probability, sometimes there's blanks and sometimes there's real bullets. And when your head is not in front of the barrel, sometimes you hear the blanks, click, 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 and occasionally you hear the real bullets, boom, boom. But it's just by the um, quantum mechanics probability that it alternates between them according to something that we today know as random. It might not be random, but we today know it as random. And the way this goes is if you lean your head down in front of it, all you'll hear is the empty clicks. Click, 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 click. And as soon as you take your head away from it, it'll have the occasional bangs again. And this is a theoretical machine to prove that each of us may be eternal. We each become the oldest human who ever lived. Everyone else dies out off around us. And we go to as long as they did. He doesn't even finish explaining it, but one would presume as long as a non-failing parts of an aging body can take you. And even then, who knows? Um, but yeah, multiverse theory is wacky, wacky, wacky. And multiverse theory is almost at the other end of solipsism, where you might think there is no real universe, there's no objective outside universe from us, but maybe it all exists in the head of one being and it exists just for their entertainment. So you got solipsism at one side of the scale and you got multiverse, uh, level four multiverse at the other side of the equation. And everything in between. There's some really crazy stuff there. I don't even know if I want to go off on those tangents, but it has to do with the waveform never collapsing. Quantum mechanics has problems. It has interpretations. Things cannot manifest in the physical world. A wave cannot become a particle and have a position in space until the waveform collapses. But waveforms theoretically never need to collapse. So no particular reality gets rendered out as the one true reality. And we might be in a infinite Hilbert space where all these universes of slightly different variation exist as like a shadowy blur coming off from each other. So far in every direction that every possible universe that could exist, every version of you is just for starters, because what if you didn't come into it? It's just more possibility and splitting all the time at every instance. And it seems to have something to do with choice. It's just too much for my, my uh, feeble little mind to, to absorb. But I would like to go over the possibilities with my kid like to explain it to them insofar as I understand, because whereas they have this allergic reaction to math, I'm thinking, no, you gotta listen to how math fits in to these, these how the universe might be so kooky, or awesome, or different things, you could, you know, inventing a portal, my kid used to be the one, one of 
be the first person to invent the portal. And I'm like, in our, we used to go over in our lifetime? Is this an in our lifetime thing? And yeah, no. Portal is probably not in our lifetime. But with the uh, warp fields being detected in the Casimir force experiments, if not portals, then maybe FTL, faster than light travel. There's some wacky stuff that may be coming onto the menu in our lifetimes. I would like them to get a little more ambitious. Maybe not as ambitious as portals in our lifetime, but maybe. One could certainly do worse than to read some sci-fi. Ah, uh, 14. I, I wish I remembered the author's name. Awesome audio books that I've read is called 14. And this person had a series of books that existed in the same world and it was very modern Lovecraft. It had some interesting premises that if you have these multiverses with all possible variations, some of these variations are gonna have top tier predators, apex predators, apex predators that may be able to penetrate dimensional barriers. Wouldn't that be a pit? So you've got these Lovecraftian monsters who are sensitive to psychic energy. And whenever the psychic energy of an adjacent dimension goes over a certain level, say a billion people evolved on the that version of planet Earth. Knock, knock, knock. It's Lovecraft monsters. Will you please open this portal? And that's kind of what happens to all dimensions where it gets over about a billion people. I don't want to give away too much. But boy, is sci-fi awesome. And the thought experiments that it uh, helps you run through. And presumably, well, one would hope, more than because in my case, a love for math. I'm taking up math more because I understand that the concepts expressed are so on the verge of being real that it's hard to actually venture into it and not seriously entertain these possibilities. And maybe we do live in Hilbert's space. The kinds of dimensions you think about with parallel dimensions right where you are as others that you can like tune into. So even if not, there could be with the augmented reality, the virtual reality, augmented reality in particular. That's where you should read Werner Vinge's Rainbow End. Oh, the Werner Vinge recommendations. Fire upon the deep. Not blight upon the deep. It is the blight in the story, that thing that's released from the archive. It's called the blight, I think. Or the darkness or whatever. It's Certainly in a wrinkle in time, they call it the dark. But the book, the title of the book I kept referring to is A Fire Upon the Deep. Because these blights spread like fire. Rainbow's End is the one where the Harry Potters battle the Pokemons in augmented reality. It slips into real reality because, you know, happiness and stuff. very near future. I think it was written in 2006 and it visualized a future that was so like 2020 that it wasn't even funny. So I'm being vilified. You know what one of the worst tactics that people use is? Do you feel safe? Do you feel safe? Tell me when you don't feel safe. Let me know when you don't safe. That's subliminal suggestion, ladies and gentlemen. That is a tactic to plant the idea in someone's head that they are in a situation where they should not feel safe, where it would be accepted if you say, oh, excuse me, I don't feel safe. Well, that should be a warning sign for you, ladies and gentlemen. If you have never done a thing in your life to make someone feel unsafe. Unsafe. Did I lay a hand on them? 
Did I pull hair out of their scalp? Did I hold them down while they were being hit? Now, I'm not saying anyone did all these things. Did I ever threaten to kill your pets? Oh, should I say this? Can I say this? Can I say this? This is horrible. I can't drag people in. Keep it positive, Mike. You're not a villain. You're not this evil person. And by you can't lose by going positive. You know that? You can't lose by going positive. Instead of saying, do you feel do you feel unsafe? Let me know when you feel unsafe. You say, you're always safe. You're always safe here. You're always safe there. Here you're safe. There you're safe. Everywhere you're safe. Safe. And God. Attack dog mode is, is another thing. When you counteract someone's basis for attack, and then they slip to the next thing. Counteract that basis for attack, and then they slip through the next thing. There's always something, there's always something. And they'll slide and they'll slide. And so that you know what you're doing is you're you're parrying, parrying, parrying. And at a certain point, you don't even want to dignify it. In fact, you know, this happened with the McCarthy era, not John McCarthy of Lisp, my beloved MIT alternative technology timeline. John McCarthy, go, go, go. I gotta learn this other McCarthy's first name. Was it Joseph McCarthy? I, I tend to think another J name. I think it's Joe McCarthy. But anyway, he was the senator. And I think it was the 1960s. It was in the era leading up to the Nixon paranoia, right, in Watergate. But it was the uh, Salem Hunt witch hunts of communists, finding communists everywhere. And Arthur Miller actually wrote Salem's Lot, which was a, is it Salem? No, The Crucible, The Crucible. I think I got that right. So Arthur Miller, who wrote Death of a Salesman, that's his most famous playwright, a writer of plays for like Broadway plays. We wrote Death of a Salesman, very good play. Everyone should read that. Someone who's going obsolete and has his ways and is a schmoozer, walrus. You know, when you talk about the walrus and the carpenter, the uh, salesman and, and that. But I, I don't, stop me before I digress again. The one I want to talk about is the Crucible. The Crucible was a Arthur Miller, Herman Miller, no, that was a movie dick, Arthur Miller. He wrote about uh, Salem, Massachusetts. That's why I thought Salem's Law. But in Salem, Massachusetts, everyone was a witch. They're a witch, you're a witch, everywhere a witch, witch. If you want to find a witch, you can find a witch. If you want to vilify someone, you can vilify someone. You can, you can make it stick. You can string them up. You can drown them in a lake. You can burn them in a crucible. It's an important lesson, ladies and gentlemen. Turn everything into an educational lesson if you can. Look at what people are saying and doing. Do not take it on face value and do not get swept up with groupthink. Groupthink bad. Thinking for yourself, good. Groupthink bad. And planting ideas in people's minds by saying things repeatedly ahead of time so that when that topic comes up, you're just repeating what was said People see through it. People see through it. And no matter how much you want to say that's not what's occurring, when you get it on video, it's pretty obvious. People are used to seeing that. And when you compare it to the kind of tactics that happen in Salem, Massachusetts, and in Hollywood during the McCarthy era, have you no shame? Have you no shame? Shame on you. Shame on you. That's what 
brought the McCarthy here to a stop. Some judge. I gotta get that judge's name because that judge is a hero. You know who our hero is? Judges. You know what it takes a long time to become? You know what you need a lot of life experience having had seen it all before? Having seen situations exactly like any that comes in front of them so that they're qualified? So that you can't pull the wall over their eyes? Judges. Yay, judges. Cops are pretty good too. ACS officers, they're pretty good. I had an ACS officer that basically wanted to high five me. The neighbor called the ACS on me because the kid flipped out over me trying to get them to brush their teeth. And apparently they believed that a violent outburst, somewhere they learned this, that going on the physical attack over the least thing that displeases them was acceptable. So that's when I got the red combat bag I think I talked about before. These stories are mine and I'm allowed to tell them. If you didn't want them told, then you should have controlled yourself. Don't teach your kids to attack. Don't set examples of this kind of behavior. They will emulate. So, on the first time, I closed myself, locked myself into the bathroom, and they bammed, and they bammed, and they bammed against the door. I thought I was going to break the door. The next week, I had the international combat bag that they use in martial arts and sparring. And when something triggered them, poof, 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 not a mark on them, nothing, nothing. And it wasn't violent either. It was equal opposite force. Okay, here's one of the big things to be on the lookout. When people are using tactics against you and you raise your level of force, when you raise your voice, to equal opposite in perfect balance, when you actually stay in lockstep tandem with them, their voice goes up, your voice goes up. Their physical attack goes up, you're counter hitting with a bag goes up. It's not even hitting, it's just Newton's law of motion. You have to push into a bit when you're being hit a little or else you get pushed back a little. So you keep an exact, um, perfect, harmonious. In fact, it becomes like music. When it's talking, they're going to tell you you're yelling. You tell them in the exact same tone of level, of decibel level, I'm not yelling. My voice is firm. And it's at the same decibel level as yours. Listen to yourself. Take out a camera and start shooting the video. You can play it back. They're going to hate it. They're going to hate it. No one likes to be called out on atrocious behavior. Accountability is the enemy of people who think they can browbeat you into correct behavior. Right? Because they got used to it. They got used to lack of accountability, and they got used to being able to, you know, browbeat, browbeat someone, beat them down. Watch uh, Keeping Up Appearances. Watch Hyacinth Keeping Up Appearances. Poor Richard. Because not all the browbeating is, is physical. Sometimes it is. I apparently am a good subject for being attacked when I'm driving in the car. It's happened to me twice in my life. You know when it happens? It happens when you don't take life too seriously, when you're lighthearted about things. Boy, laugh when someone's taking themselves too seriously. They will go off on you. Oh my God. That's what it was. I was just being myself. Now, is that narcissistic? Is is like seeing the humor in things. It's not like a cruel laugh. They, they will interpret it that way. If you see the humor in things, and you are, you know, letting it roll off your back and not taking things too seriously, and they're taking things seriously, they're going to interpret your laughing as a profoundly personal attack. Profoundly personal attack. I hope this does get you I hope when you go through this, there's take it as a learning opportunity. Take it as a learning opportunity. If you could
can get away with it. Now, you probably can't. It's probably not very good advice. But when people get this way, you should hunk their nose like they're a clown. Even if you don't touch them, even if you don't, like, reach out in their face, you can do it from a distance. Honk, honk. They know you're honking their nose. Honk, honk. It's like kids in the hall squishing the heads. Honk their nose. Honk, honk. You know what triggers people? The walrus and the carpenter. Alice in Wonderland. Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, but Alice in Wonderland, as far as most people are concerned. And the Disney movie, as far as most people are concerned. But to those who enjoy literature, it's Alice's Adventures in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass. Two good reads. To see hostile worlds where there are no friends. The British way. Keeping up appearances. then to like heal your mind a little bit you should read the wizard of oz the first book bloody <laughs> very bloody but you should read it because the wizard of oz is much more the american way friends teams killing a witch in the end Oh, but the books that come after, man. The books that come after. That is where the deep channeling. L. Frank Baum, man. Oh, I wish he was alive today. I'd give him a hug. That guy, that guy. You know what he did? He read the letters of his fans. He actually read, like, every letter. And he would them for the best ideas. You know what he did then? He made the next Wizard of Oz book using those ideas. He had a redemption arc, a redemption arc for the wizard. The wizard was a really bad dude initially. He took over Ozma as a person from what was it? Um, uh, Omaha? Um, uh, Nebraska? Ohio, I forget, but he was from somewhere in the, uh, you know, Bible thumping bread belt of, of, of the Americas, who got to Oz by way of a hot air balloon, so he penetrated a magic barrier in a great desert. And he took over the city of Oz! I forget if he overthrew the royal family of Oz, but certainly he took the daughter Ozma and gave Ozma to Mombi the witch to be their servant. Chain who it was either Mombi or the wizard changed Mombi from a, a girl into a boy and made that boy the house slave of the witch. The wizard did that. The wizard said, oh, here's here's Ozma of Oz. Let's, let's wipe her memory, turn her into a boy, and use her as a slave. That's what the wizard of Oz did. In order to get the rightful heir to Oz out of the way. And then Mombi was going to turn that boy slave into a stone. She was mixing up a petrification formula to turn poor, uh, I think they caught him Tip, Tip, or Tad, was it Tad or Tip? It was going to turn poor Tip into a, uh, a water fountain that the squirrels could bathe in a bowl that Tip would be holding. dear wizard who, who did this who, who cast the princess of Oz into that fate ended up being an okay character 
had a story arc, an arc of redemption. It's never too late. It's never too late. And you know, if you think things got bad, like all of the sudden, like one week it was fine and then the other week you're a villain, maybe it's not about you. Maybe it's about other issues that have been building up and have been reaching a critical point. And it's like Tinder, not the Tinder app, but like Tinder in a fire where just the slightest match makes the flame fire up. You escalated it, is, seems to be the, f the favorite uh, phrase to use against me. You escalated it. You escalated it. Yeah, you know what? I did not share that child in on that conversation. Oh my God. I never would. How in bad taste is it to bring a child into a conversation like that? That was wrong. Shame on you. Shame on you. That is not a discussion that should have had personal text screenshot and taken out of context and forwarded to a child. It's just wrong. The moral character shows moral character shows, just like other situations that came before it, it's not going to resolve itself, it needs to be forcibly resolved, while it's not too late, because it's never too late, this is just the right time to resolve these things, I'm doing the right thing, police that were called on me today said, yeah, you're doing the right thing. They wanted to probably stay objective. They didn't want to say it maybe in so many words, but they were like, yeah, uh, maybe get them into public school after the exchange they had with them. It was not the exchange of a prepared person for life. by language, by those who created language. 
institutionalized unfair things in our language. <laughs> Woe is men. Woe men is women? Really? I'm sure there's a better explanation for it, but it's an unfortunate fact of convergent evolution of meaning. Whoa. Whoa. His story? His story? It's not fair. It's not fair. And things should be set right. There does need to be the setting right of things. No doubt. And clothes and style and pronouns? Fine. But the facts of evolution, yeah, I still believe in it. I still believe in it. Tendencies, clustering of traits and attributes according to hardware. Yeah. Millions of years of evolution. You gotta be careful talking about this stuff because the very people who want to fight for non-binary seem to be, in my mind, some of the most binary thinkers I've ever encountered. The world's not binary. The world is not binary. Yeah, well, that's right. It's a spectrum. It's a spectrum. A spectrum of many dimensions where the clustering of traits and attributes cluster around body designs, life form designs, which happen to be sexually dimorphic in nature. Sexual dimorphism is a thing. opening chapter about lobsters. I think it's his opening chapter. To learn about the Jordan Peterson of lobsters. It's a good lesson. The physiological changes in the body that happen from male dominance fights. There are hierarchies. Hierarchies are often very clear amongst you know, groups. This person's above this person. This person's below that person. And usually, according in primates, according to this, uh, this uh, chapter in Peterson's book, um, it's usually among the males of primates. And he does a simplified explanation with lobsters instead of going with the primates and the monkeys. Very well studied stuff. I'm sure you can dig up all those studies. But he focuses in on the lobsters because the male lobsters battle each other for dominance. I'm sure if you looked long enough, you'd find some female mo lobsters battling each other for dominance, undergoing the same chemical changes in their body. But on the whole, the average distribution is that if you're going to find two lobsters fighting, fighting over territory, fighting over a mate, what have you, it's going to be two males. They're often fighting over mating rights with females. Did I make this up? Is this, am I the first person to ever say this and that is actually not the way nature often works in so many cases? I think, I think I might not be the first one to make these observations. Now, biases in language, bad. Biases in language, bad. Expectations of clothing and styles. And job roles, bad. Understanding that behavior doesn't come from out of nowhere, good. That behavior sometimes comes from instinctual instincts, genetically encoded into us places where it might not be our fault we feel this stuff. We can try and overcome it. Being human is greatly about overcoming our animal insides. 
But being human is also about being in touch with our animal inside. It's about not total denial. It's about controlling who gets the spotlight in the three ring circus. You are both the ringleader, you're the human ringleader who talks about the things going on in the different areas of your mind, the different acts going on. Here's the tightrope, here's the uh, high diver, you know, here's the trapeze artist. And the ringleader can draw the attention to the different acts. And when he does, or she does, when they do, the spotlight moves to these different acts. So there's a couple of things working in unison. The voice, the voice of the uh, three ring circus leader, the voice of the ringleader. There's a voice and a language as a tool component here. And then there's also the fact that the spotlight works in unison with him so that the actual physical reality of where the focus is drawn follows the voice. The voice of this in control person says, now if you look over into ring two, you will see, and they have maybe a big gesture that they do, and then the spotlight goes to follow their gesture, and all the eyes of the audience follow that, and they change their focus over there. That's what the human inside of us does. Now, the acts going on in those different rings are often the animals, or, you know, less and less. Ringling, Ringling Brother, P.T. Barnum, Barnum and Bailey Circus, no more animals. It almost killed them as a circus, but they're going the route of Cirque. Cirque du Soleil was ahead of its time. An all human talent act circus. So, Ringling Brothers, there's a sucker born every minute. Finally, the suckers are not animals. Thank you, thank you. The uh, Big Top Circus, it's dogs and cats. Dogs and cats can be the act. Sometimes a horse or a pony. So the Big Top, so I guess here, you know, in, in, the, <laughs> in the bubble, <laughs> we had an enlightened circus of that dog and cat. Was it any more humane? Is it any, oh, any more okay to do it with dogs because they're pack animals? Because they're pack animals? Yeah, it's bad to do it with elephants, for sure. Watching the elephants walk through the, uh, what is it, the Holland or the Lincoln Tunnel, that was a, um, a thing to get elephants in and out of Manhattan. They would actually walk them through a tunnel and people would gather around and watch the elephants walking out the tunnel. Those days are over. And if they weren't over before COVID, they certainly are now. Three ring circuses, humans being human. Don't fall for tricks, ladies and gentlemen. Start making your circus a humane act. Be like Barnum and Bailey and phase the animal acts out. Better still, don't wait to be forced. Be like Cirque du Soleil and go to all humans because you want to. And put more style and magic and storytelling and humor. If you haven't seen a Cirque, go see Cirque. I think I'm going to take my clan, my crew, to go see Cirque, Cirque du Soleil. There we have it. That was a good video. That wasn't too bad, was it? I kept it positive. One of the biggest days in my life. I'm allowed to make this video. I am totally. I hope. I hope it gets seen, right? Let them watch it from begin to end. They have to get the full context. And let shine those spotlights. Let shine those spotlights. Shining spotlights is good. Shining spotlights good. In this ring, ladies and gentlemen, you'll see a dedicated father who is all in in the game, who will stop at nothing to make sure their child has the chances in life they deserve. Who did it over the past two years by getting some opportunity at space and freedom openness and 
sparse population. Before that, it was two years in a cramped studio, as close as he could be, but bam, right there. Hour and a half away from where he was living. All in. They move hour and a half away, I move an hour and a half away. COVID hits, I move an hour and a half away, yet still again. But this time, instead of towards the kid, away from the kid, and I can do this drive. These drives are the gift and the reward. Doing these videos is the prize of the drive. And yeah, it might have taken its toll, but you know what? These days with electronics, there's nothing particularly, you know, mind-numbing about such a ride. If you spend an hour and a half using your electronics at home, you spend an hour and a half using the electronics in the car. One to get there, one to get back. That's all. It's three hours of maybe screen time. What's three hours of screen time in an entire weekend? It's nothing. So it's really not that long of a drive. And I certainly enjoy, you know, either you would see me doing it either on the ride to or the ride from. So these, these uh, videos are coming to an end. But I shared a little with you about my mom, my dad, my experiences, my readapting, adapting, readapting, readapting. And so after a while, right, this all played out all that my first round of drama by the time I was 30. So from 30 to 40, I'm in New York um, agency life, a few different agencies, surprisingly few for that uh, 10 year span, 360i, you can still dunk in the dark <laughs> and whatever else their claims to fame is. I don't know. They got wrapped up by a few giant marketing firms. They're now part of uh, Dentsu Japan and Aegis. So they're just one of the fish now in uh, another alphabet soup marketing company. I got out of it before then. I was there a little bit during Dentsu, but that was like a good five-year run. So half of it was 360i. Half of it was at this tiny little place where I have endearing friends who have lasted with me to today. It's really a lot of fun watching Lily, Lily Ray, Lily Ray tour the world going on her SEO tours. I told Lily Ray, you should join the SEO conferences. You, could, you should write a few articles, choose a topic, write on it. No one in SEO is really that much of an authority because who's to say what Google does? Just use statistics and studies. Put out a few articles, join the conference circuit. They're gonna love you. And she's doing that. She took my advice. Go Lily Ray. And then um, John, John Morbido, who's just a dear friend and maybe I'll connect with him where I'm going. He's uh, someone whose uh, job path keeps almost connect reconnecting with me. But he's staying where he, where he is because I taught him, look, here's your situation. <laughs> That's a good situation. And I think I gave him that advice before I attempted to recruit him out to other places since then. And I think he's remembered my original advice. Good for him. And has taken it over my subsequent, you know, requests, you know, for more selfish reasons. But yeah, God bless him. He's going through, uh, you know, the whole... Uh, father for the first time experience and everything and gotta hang out with John more. Wow. Ah, my friends, my friends, my friends. Yeah, so my life in an agency world in New York and then I got the heck out of agency life. It's like, whoa, gotta get out of this before my my mind goes numb because it's all PowerPoint, mostly PowerPoint. <laughs> and then uh, I went in the house where I could work my craft again, where I could at least work my craft enough so that I'm with the same clients for years on end and it's not swapped out underneath of me as they cycle through which directors are on which accounts and you can never get close to the clients or the uh, technical uh, action because <laughs> Mikey likes the equipment. Mikey installed the Hittail servers. Mikey loved the days of co-location. And now that the cloud is upon us, the cloud is okay too. But I also love the unique new hardware that's possible both in our houses and things like NASA's network application servers, but also right on our laptops in the form of like lots of extra little learn Linux playgrounds right on your Windows uh, 
10 or Windows 11 box. Who would have thought that you could have a Windows machine, powerful laptop, all the bells and whistles of the value they try and give you in a modern laptop, a lot of value for the money, but then have true, modern, generic Linux, and then have Linux, 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 Linux in containers. It's, a, it's a really good, it's exciting, it's what I'm up to now. So I'll leave it on that good note because, you know, there's it's always Hanukkah Eve. <laughs> it's always one of the days of Hanukkah. You know, uh, Christmas Eve has a certain feeling to it because it's all the gifts waiting for you under the tree there. Oh, I wish I could show you all this wildlife that I'm passing as I'm going. But, uh, yeah, that's the feeling. You make it that way for yourself so there's always an adventure. You're always on your next Alice or Dorothy, uh, preferably uh, Dorothy adventure, so you have some friends along the way. And the characters are not quite so uh, hostile as they are in Wonderland. And, you can, and hopefully we all have a, a Tin Woodman in our life, a Scarecrow, 